Hello and welcome to Freewave TV. I'm Paige Friedman, bringing you the latest in maritime news from around the world. Today in maritime news, the world watches Ukrainian port for a sign that it is exporting grain again. Port of Oakland returns to operations after being disrupted during trucker protests. Strike at South Korean shipbuilder ends after seven weeks. European shippers are demanding a review on European Union regulation. A shipping company in the Philippines is issued a default notice from banks. A shipping company creates a new inland service between two neighboring countries. Boat carrying Haitian migrants capsizes in the Bahamas. The shipping industry is closely monitoring the port of Kernomorsk to see if there are any signs that the shipment of grain in the Black Sea has finally resumed. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Ukrainian ports were closed. However, this past Friday, the two countries signed a deal in Istanbul to create a safe passage to the Bosphorus. The port of Kernomorsk is set to be the first port to export grain, with Odessa to follow. Ukraine is hopeful that over the next two weeks, all the country's ports will be able to resume shipping grain. In the United States, the port of Oakland is up and running again after truckers started protests a few days ago over AB5. AB5 is a law in California that requires companies that hire independent contractors to reclassify them as employees. Truckers have been upset over the law, as many of them are owners of their trucks and they wouldn't want to become employees. The Board of Oakland has now resumed all operations as free speech zones were set up over the weekend so the port could safely return to operations while also accommodating protesters. The port has also urged truckers to complain with lawmakers instead of the port. After 51 days, the strike at Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering in South Korea has finally come to an end. The subcontract workers agreed to take a smaller wage increase than they were asking for, and they also got job guarantees. The almost two-month strike cost the SME hundreds of millions of dollars, and now the shipbuilder is looking to get back on track with production. In Europe, 10 trade organizations, which represent the owners and forwarders of cargo, port terminal operators, and other parts of the supply chain that are dependent on container shipping, are calling for a review of European Union's consortia block exemption regulation for the container shipping industry. The organizations wrote to the Commission saying that since the regulation was last renewed in April 2020, European businesses and other parties in the supply chain have had significant disruption to the movement of goods by container shipping, with many sailings being canceled or diverted to other ports, and some ports being bypassed at short notice. They also claimed that the regulation exempts liners from many of the checks and balances of European Union competition law and permits them to exchange commercially sensitive information to manage the number and size of ships deployed and the frequency and timing of sailings on trade routes. The organizations have asked that the review includes consideration of new measures and mechanisms and allow sufficient time for these to be considered and implemented before the current regulation expires in April 2024. In other news, the largest shipping company in the Philippines is dealing with financial issues which have been brought to light after a sister firm defaulted on a $4 million debt to banks last week. Chelsea Logistics and Infrastructure Holdings was issued a default notice over a real estate development being carried out at Clark Airport, and the default has caused concern about how much debt the company is dealing with. According to data from the end of 2020, the group had debts of $4.6 billion, which is doubled in a three-year span. Yesterday, the group announced that the default from last week was taken care of. Shipping company Mayers launched a new inland container service between India and Bangladesh. The shipper said the service will provide a faster, more reliable inland waterway solution to transport containers between the two countries. The new service started with the shipment of 50 containers from Kolkata in India to a river port near Dhaka in Bangladesh on a barge. At least 17 Haitians are dead after the boat capsized off the coast of the Bahamas. Divers recovered the bodies in the water, one of which was a child. Rescuers were able to bring 25 people to safety, including a woman who they found alive inside the overturned boat. They are still searching for other missing people. Authorities said that survivors told them they paid between $3,000 and $8,000 to make the trip, which was reportedly taking them to Miami. Immigration Minister Keith Bell said that he mourns the migrants who lost their lives in pursuit of a better life 
and he also encouraged Haitians to tell their loved ones not to risk their lives. And now, here's the news making headlines around the world. After Russia's Gazprom announced its tightening of gas flows through the Nord Stream 1 last Wednesday, European countries struck a compromise that agreed to curb Europe's overall gas demands. Starting tomorrow, the pipeline will release just 20% of its capacity. As many European countries are already facing difficulties, Brussels is urging member states to save gas and store it for winter for fear Russia will completely cut off flow in retaliation for Western sanctions over its war with Ukraine. Despite a Russian missile attack on the Ukrainian port of Odessa over the weekend, Russia's defense ministry announced today that the Joint Coordination Center, established as part of a landmark deal to resume grain exports from Ukraine, has begun its work in Istanbul. The Joint Coordination Center will work in a four-way format, having Turkey, Ukraine, and the United Nations collaborate and mediate in the wake of these trying times. As grain begins its shipping, Africa waits with newfound help. During a visit to Cameroon on Tuesday, French President Emmanuel Macron dismissed Russian suggestions Western sanctions were to blame and described the ongoing global food crisis as one of Russia's weapons of war. Cameroon, like many developing countries, is grappling with sharp increases in prices for oil, fertilizer, and food. Africa has stayed neutral on its stance on the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict as the country is dependent on Russian grain and energy, but also buys Ukrainian grain that has been disrupted by the conflict. Cameroon is a mineral-rich African nation and is a major food producer from the region. Macron's delegation plans to seek investment opportunities in its agricultural sector. More news from Africa stems from a celebration by the newly elected Tunisia president, Kai Saeed, although the polls saw a low percentage of voters. Main opposition partners boycotted the poll due to a new constitution that gave him almost unlimited powers. Saeed appeared at a party to celebrate his win amongst overjoyed supporters. With a turnout of only 27.5% of voters reaching the polls, opponents deny the election's legitimacy as they fear reverting back to autocracy. In other news, after searching and finding the bodies of British journalist Dom Phillips and a local indigenous expert Bruno Perea last month, a Brazilian court has charged three men with the murders. The two men went missing in the Javari Valley, a remote area near the border with Peru. Two of the charged men assisted police in locating the victims' bodies. Prosecutors claim that the three were illegally fishing in the area and decided to kill Phillips and Perea after the pair had snapped a picture of their boat. The murders exposed the lawlessness that prevails in Brazil's Amazon region. After Panama faced weeks of angry protests and street blockades demanding the government take measures to stem the quickly rising cost of living, protesters are starting to see results. On Monday, the government announced it will regulate the price of 72 food items. President Laurentino Cortizo's government came to an agreement with powerful unions and had the Catholic Church as a mediator. The government released a statement explaining how the cost cuts save the public saying that with the regulation of the 72 products, the cost of the basic food basket would decrease by 30%, which is a savings of more than $80. A court in Egypt requested a legal amendment to allow for the live broadcast of the execution of the man who murdered a female student. Last month, a video horrified its viewers as they watched 22-year-old Mohammed Adele stab Nayera Ashraf to death after repeatedly refusing his advances. The Egyptian court that sentenced Adele to death sent a letter to the parliament asking for permission to broadcast his death to achieve a goal of deterrence. Although Egypt does not broadcast executions, the court is eager to hear parliament's decision. While Egypt tackles live executions, Myanmar's ruling military faces mass scrutiny after executing four Justice for the People activists. Acting as Myanmar's first execution in decades, the military announced the executions on Monday justifying its acts by claiming the four were aiding terror acts by a civilian resistance movement. The news of the killings sparked anger worldwide, with the European Union, the United Nations, the United States, Britain, Australia, and the European Union leading a course of criticism condemning the junta for its brutality. 
Junta military spokesperson Zarman Ta defended its acts by saying this was justice for the people. These criminals were given the chance to defend themselves. Tomochiro Kato was 25 when he attacked pedestrians in central Tokyo in 2008. Kato drove a truck into a lunchtime crowd of pedestrians in the Akihabara shopping district, killing three people. He then got out of the car and stabbed his victims with a dagger, killing four and wounding eight. Minutes after his acts, Kato was apprehended by police and later admitted his crimes in his trial, saying he had been angered by online bullying. This Tuesday, the government confirmed it had ordered his execution. In Australia, data showed hospital admissions for COVID-19 have reached a new high for a second straight day. The COVID flare-up is driven by the highly infectious BA.4.5 Omicron subvariant, putting severe pressure on hospitals. As death tolls rise to their second highest, Queensland expects its patient numbers to peak in around late August. Although authorities are resisting the pressure to reinstate pandemic precautions, Australia is resist resisting by urging businesses to let staff work from home and recommending people get booster shots. Data shared exclusively with Reuters show that the Alps glaciers are on track for their highest mass losses in at least 60 years of record keeping. Since last winter brought relatively little snowfall, the Alps have melted through two big early summer heat waves. During this heat wave, the elevation at which water froze was measured at a record high of 5,184 meters, compared with the normal summer level of between 3,000 and 3,500 meters. After igniting and rapidly spreading eastward, firefighters were able to contain the Oak Fire on Monday from reaching Yosemite National Park, as thousands of people remained in, under evacuation orders. According to officials, Cal Fire could concentrate 2,500 firefighters on the fire due to the absence of other wildfires in the area, and the lack of wind let the continual use of planes to drop water and fire retardant. While fires rage in California, Pope Francis put out a long-lasting fire in Canada by apologizing. On Monday, Pope Francis apologized to Canada's native people while standing on their land. The Pope apologized for the church's hyenas role in schools where indigenous children were abused. He called their forced cultural assimilation a deplorable evil and disastrous error. The apology was directed toward First Nations, Metis, and Inuit, and was the first apology made by the Pope on native soil. Its trip to Canada is part of a tour to heal deep wounds that rose to the fore after the discovery of unmarked graves at residential schools last year. We're now gonna take over to Jean-Louis, who's gonna share what's going on in the sports world. of a smoldering heat wave, we got Free Wave TV. As always, I'm Jean-Louis of Free Wave TV, and from the States to across the pond, here are your sports stories from all over the globe. Day two, the LV County Championships are currently underway for both Divisions 1 and 2. As a host of games are going on as we speak, at the time of recording, Essex and Somerset is taking place with Somerset yet to bat. Essex is currently 405 through the first. Surrey and Warwickshire are also in action as Surrey trail Warwickshire by 155 runs with seven wickets remaining. A rain delay has stalled Hampshire-Yorkshire match where before the match Hampshire trailed by 154 runs with eight wickets to remain. Division 2 has Durham and Middlesex in action where Durham is currently 224 for one. Derbyshire trails Warwickshire by eight runs with nine wickets remaining and Nottinghamshire are going 84 for seven in the first inning against Sussex. Stay locked to Freeway for any critical updates on any of these matchups. The transfer season is in full effect for football's finest. As with many names looking to make new moves ahead of the Euro 2022 semifinal matchup between England and Sweden, one name in particular that has made waves off the field, however, is multi-champ Cristiano Ronaldo. The 37-year-old is set to meet with Manchester United's manager, Ten Hag, today to discuss his future with the club. After this year with United, Ronaldo has reportedly wanted out of his contract with the team. But despite it, the boss stated that Ronaldo is firmly within the plans for the team. 
Ahead of the Trump National Golf Club event, the LIV looks to announce a new format for the upcoming 2023 season. The next year, we'll see 14 events with a 48-player field, mostly with players competed since the infancy of the league this past month. The rest of the field will be competed in a qualifier format with projected new members joining in the league as it gains more and more traction as the months pass on. Stars with the likes of Phil Mickelson, Brooks Kepka, and Dustin Johnson have all flocked over to the league, each with lucrative offers to boot. The Indian Olympic Association announces that reigning javelin champ Naraj Chopra would draws from the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham due to injury. It was said that the 24-year-old had suffered a groin injury this past week at the World Championships, where he went for an 88.13 distance en route to a silver medal. Bad news just keeps getting worse in the Olympic world as U.S. soccer great Hope Solo pleaded guilty to DWI yesterday. Now, the star was found out passed out behind the wheel of her car back in March with her two-year-old twins in the back seat. The star was elected to be the U.S. Soccer Hall of Famer back in January. However, due to the news, the goalkeeper has delayed her induction until next year's ceremony. Seven players from the Manly War Wing Sea Eagles will boycott their upcoming matchup this coming Thursday. The news of the matter stems from the team's announcement that they will become the first team in Australia's National Rugby League to don a uniform that promotes the LGBT community. The reaction has been polarizing on both ends, with pro players' stance wanting consent on the decision and pro team stances referring to examples of players openly turning a blind eye to team and player management. For more news on this, head over to Freeway. In the NBA, free agency has come to a standstill, with stars such as Kevin Durant and Donovan Mitchell being involved in trade talks with major market teams. However, in light of that, the biggest news of the week stems from former world champ Slava Medvedenko, two-time NBA champion with the franchise the Los Angeles Lakers. The forward is auctioning each of his 14 karat gold rings to the SCP auctions through August 5th. Medvedenko will send all of the proceeds of the ring purchase to his Fly High Foundation, helping sports enthusiasts in his native Ukraine, the country embroiled in the conflict with Russia. Explaining his reasoning, the NBA star outlined his firsthand experiences in Kviv, the city which is under surveillance by the Russian government on a regular basis. The 10-year vet averaged five points in his career, shooting 45% of field during his tenure. Green Bay police are investigating a situation involving Packer A.J. Dillon, who was grabbed by a cop during the Bayern, Munich, and Manchester City FC exhibition at Lambeau Field. It was said that the officer grabbed Dillon by the neck and collar, giving him a shove, leading to an ovation of booze. When asked about the incident, Dillon downplayed it, citing miscommunication between both parties. And lastly, we end off with sports entertainment. The chairman of the board, Vince McMahon, steps down after 40 years at the helm. The 76-year-old is known as the igniter of the modern-day professional wrestling scene, monopolizing the sport and making cross-banded events such as WrestleMania and SummerSlam. The news comes soon after his polarized case involving ex-WWE personnel, in which he gave up in excess of $12 million of hush money to halt any claims of sexual misconduct. The company has since named his daughter, Stephanie McMahon, as co-chairman, along with tenured WWE official Nick Khan. It's a new era for wrestling, and it's a new day in free wave. But till then, I'm Jean-Louis, there's your sports. Happy Tuesday, folks.
That's all we have for today. For more detailed news, you can visit our website, www.freewavetv.com. On behalf of all of us here at Freewave TV, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on Thursday for our next newscast. Thank you.